Book One, Chapter Two, The Last Dinner. Kamal's Good News. The smell of dinner smacked Kamal as he opened the door. He threw his head back slowly, and his eyes grew wide as the smell of spaghetti sauce and seasoned fish surrounded him. His shoulders dropped. His fear subsided. His mouth watered and his stomach gurgled. He headed straight for the kitchen. Mama, he exclaimed as he moved to hug her. Kamal's mother, Ayana and Jama, was a lean, dark-complected woman. Very attractive. All the Njamas were lean, dark-complected, attractive people. Despite her lean build and advancing age, she still had the curvaceous hourglass figure that had caught the eye of her husband many years ago. Unlike many teenagers, Kamal was never ashamed to be seen with his mother. She always looked good. She was very fashionable, but she dressed like a mother. Mothers of some of the kids at school didn't handle aging very well. They thought they could regain youth by removing fabric. Short-cut skirts, low-cut blouses, too tight sweaters. These women looked like hookers, and they embarrassed their kids, especially their sons. But to Kamal, his mother was nothing like that. In his eyes, his mother was flawless. She could do everything. She was a phenomenal cook. She kept the house spotless. She decorated their home so beautifully that at times, it felt like they lived in an art museum. She was brilliant. There were very few topics she couldn't speak about intelligently. Religion, health, politics, history. She seemed to know a good bit about everything. In the rare instances when she didn't know about a topic, she would drive a conversation just by asking insightful questions. She was probably the coolest, most composed woman he had ever seen. He had never seen her lose her patience or her self-control. She had to be borderline perfect. How else would she have survived all these years married to Jabari and Jama? What's for dinner, Kamal asked. Ayana smiled. She knew Kamal loved her cooking, and his excitement about dinner made her feel good. Spaghetti, fried whiting, spinach, Caesar salad, and garlic bread. Beautiful, he shouted. Kamal looked at the clock. It was 3.55. His mother didn't say anything about the test. It was still early, so he figured that Mr. Evans had not called yet. What time will Pops be home? He will be here any minute. Why don't you relax, freshen up, and help Rafia prepare the table? Dinner will be ready at 5 o'clock. Kamal ran to his room, changed his clothes, and washed his face and hands. He peered in Rafia's room. Good afternoon, Princess Rafia. Kamal! Rafia stopped her play, ran to Kamal, and gave him a big hug. She had just turned five a few months ago, and she was always excited to see her big brother. I'm building an airport with Lego blocks. Come build with me, Kamal. She grabbed his hand and tugged on him. Kamal smiled. No, sweetie. I'm going to my room. I will come back in a few minutes, and we can set the table for dinner. Rafia let out a disappointed whine. Okay. Kamal went to his room, shut the door, and calculated how much money he could earn this summer by working at Gary's. Over 10 weeks of summer, he could earn just under $3,000. What could I do with $3,000? He mumbled to himself as he wrote out his list. Let's see. This will pay for school clothes, school supplies, oh, student activity fees. The school was always charging additional fees for things. Field trip fees, athletic participation fees, class retreat fees, PE uniform fees. If it happened outside of class, there was a fee for it. His dad hated it. He sometimes called the school Fees Are Us Middle School. He also complained that Du Bois would probably be worse. No worries, Pops. I will cover some of those pesky fees. Kamal felt proud of his list. Of course, he wouldn't mention the bling. There's no need to distract the old man. This information was intended to ease his aging mind. Hearing his dad at the door, Kamal jumped up, went to get Rafia, and head downstairs. Daddy! Rafia sang out as she ran to Jabari, jumped into his arms, and hugged his neck. She hugged him just as she had hugged Kamal. She gave him the same invitation, too. I'm building an airport with Lego blocks. You want to help me? Of course, beautiful. I will help right after dinner. Jabari kissed Rafia on the forehead and put her down. Hujambo Baba. Kamal asked in Swahili as he approached. His father liked it when Kamal spoke Swahili, but Kamal never really applied himself to learning it, and he only knew a few phrases. This simple greeting meant, how are you, father? 
Hearing the greeting, Jabari looked up at his wife as if to ask, what gives? She shrugged. Hugging Kamal, Jabari responded, Sijambo Monangu. Jabari knew that despite his best efforts, Kamal knew very little Swahili. So he kept his response short and simple. This greeting meant, I am fine, my son. And with that, Jabari moved to hug Ayana. Kamal guided Rafia as she set the table. She had a general idea of how to set the table, but she sometimes confused the location of glasses and the place settings were almost never lined up properly. Kamal didn't care. If the food was in arm's reach, he could handle the rest. But he was asked to help, so he did. These types of details were important to his father, and there was no use arguing. He stopped periodically to give explanations to Rafia, reminding her how it should be done, and then letting her do it herself. While they worked, Kamal kept an eye on the clock. Then it happened. Right at 4.30, the phone rang. His mother answered it. Kamal tried to look disinterested in the call. He squinted his eyes as though checking the alignment of a place setting. At the same time, he strained, trying to hear the phone conversation. He wasn't fooling anyone. Rafia asked for help with the serving dishes three times, but he didn't hear her. He just stood there squinting and nudging a plate back and forth. The phone call ended and dinner was served at 4.45. Kamal searched his parents' faces, but he could tell nothing. They were both pleasant, but impassive. It was strange. They both had this habit of hiding their true emotions and presenting a neutral face to the world. Kamal once saw them drive a car salesman to frustration as he presented his sales pitch. He joked, cajoled, flattered the Njamas, proclaimed how great the car was, and talked about the high demand for the car. The whole time, Jabari and Iana just watched him, listened, expressionless, and said nothing. As he went on, the salesman began stuttering, sweating, and growing increasingly uncomfortable. By the end, he almost gave the car away. Even as they signed the paperwork, they were composed and expressionless. Kamal had no such ability. He was eager to hear about this phone call, and it wouldn't have been more obvious if he wrote the word eager on his forehead. Mr. Njama said grace, and as everyone began to eat, he steered the conversation to reports of everyone's day, news from friends and family, and reflections on society. No one said anything about the phone call. After he began eating, Kamal didn't seem to mind. He had a voracious appetite, and the food was delicious. He had two full servings of everything. After a second serving, he stopped. It was not that he was full, but he didn't want to seem as greedy, especially not today. After everyone had eaten their fill, Mrs. Njama went to the kitchen to get dessert. As she stood, she looked at Kamal. We received a call from Mr. Evans today, but of course you knew that. She smiled as she walked away. Mr. Njama picked up where she left off. Congratulations, Kamal. That is a noteworthy achievement. Your work is paying off. Jabari's affirmation surprised Kamal, and he grew visibly excited. Asante, Baba, Kamal said, thanking his father. I don't understand how 70% on a test is a good score. Mr. Njama explained, no, son. A score of 70% on a test would mean that you got 70% of the answers on the test correct. Your score was at the 70th percentile. That means that your score was higher than 70% of the people who took the test. Wow. Kamal was shocked and impressed with himself but he wasn't sure if it was impressive. Is that pretty good? Jabari looked at him intently, searching him. That depends, he paused. Is it your best? Kamal shrugged. I don't know. As Ayana returned with dessert, Kamal blurted out, I have more good news. In his excitement and nervousness, he began sloppily spilling his plan. So Salters from the boys high school came today. He met with me and Big Javen. Big Javen and me, Ayana corrected. He met with Big Javen and me, Kamal continued. He wants us to try out for the JV team at Du Bois next year. That's excellent news, Kamal, Jabari exclaimed. Coach Salters is very restrictive about who he allows to try out for the team. So that is a very special invitation. More affirmation? Kamal was beside himself. And he continued even more excitedly. He gave me and Big Javen, uh, uh, Big Javen and me some things to work on over the summer and he wants us to go to basketball camp. I have the flyer for the camp. Ayana flashed a glance at Jabari. Jabari saw her, but he continued looking at Kamal. Kamal continued, but don't worry about the cost of the camp. There is a very good chance that I'll be getting a landscaping job at Gary's this summer. I'll be able to pay for it. 
You will be able to pay for the camp? Ayana asked coolly. Kamal nodded his head vigorously. Yeah, and yes, Ayana corrected. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I can pay for the camp. And school clothes. And fees. He blurted out fees and grinned stupidly. Jabari sat for some time, saying nothing. Ayana quietly ate her dessert. Kamal's grin and his excitement faded with the prolonged silence. He pushed his dessert away and stared blankly at the table. Rafia looked around confused and asked innocently, Is dinner over? Section 2. A Final Rebellion Mr. Njama's head turned from Rafia. His expressionless face settled squarely on Kamal, and he spoke slowly and deliberately. Son, we have already made plans for you to attend the Aket this summer. You will not be able to work at Gary's, and you will not be able to attend Colt Salter's basketball camp. Kamal's face contorted into a mask of anger, but he remained silent. Ms. Njama excused Rafia. Sweetheart, you can go if you'd like. Be sure to wash your face and hands before you play. As Rafia stood from the table to be excused, she walked towards Kamal, grabbed his head, and whispered loudly in his ear, Don't be mad, Kamal. You can have some of my allowance. As she walked away, Kamal sighed heavily. He opened his reddened eyes. They were beginning to tear. Why? Why do I have to go? All I want to do is spend my summer working and training. Is that so bad? As he spoke, he realized he was not being interrupted, and he grew more confident. As he grew more confident, his voice found more bass and more volume. I don't cause you any problems. I don't hang out in the streets. I don't use or sell drugs. I've never disgraced you. Why can't I have just one thing that's important to me? As Kamal's tone and volume rose, Iyana feared he would go too far, and she knew that Jabari would bring Kamal and his volume back down. She didn't want to see that, so she interjected. Kamal, we want you to have and to enjoy every good thing that life has to offer, and we are preparing you for that. Now, the Akhet is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Most young men will never see this opportunity. You are going to make new friends, probably lifelong friends, and you're going to become a stronger man because of it. Ayana's tone was soothing. She was nurturing. She dropped her mask of impassivity and allowed Kamal to see and to feel the love she had for him. And it worked. Kamal protested again, this time with a more moderated tone. You think I need to go to the Saket to make friends and to be a stronger, better person? As he thought about the implications, he grew incensed, and his volume rose again. I'm not bad. I'm a good kid. Mr. Njama responded. Yes, son, you are a good kid, but we are not re rearing you to be a kid. We are preparing you to be a man. We want you to be a man that does more than survive in this wretched world. We want you to thrive. To do that, you must be more than a good kid. Mr. Njama showed none of the warmth and nurturing that his wife showed. He was impassive, strictly business. The conversation was getting to be too much for Kamal. His head was swimming in a sea of thoughts, ideas, rebuttals, protests, and he was angry. He couldn't sort it all out. He knew there was no use arguing, but his disappointment and pride drove him on. He could not let it go. But I'm 13 years old. I'm almost 14. You can't keep making decisions about my life without talking to me about it. It was all Iana could do to keep from laughing. 13 years old, she thought. Boy, we have clothes older than you. Jabari responded. Kamal, we can make decisions about your life without telling you. And we will make decisions about your life without telling you. Mr. Njama was growing weary of the debate, so he ended it. Now this conversation is over. Take some time and get yourself together. When you have cleared your head, we can talk more about what your summer will look like. Kamal sat at the table for a moment, brooding. Ayana began clearing the dishes. Kamal stood to walk away, but stopped when he heard Mr. Njama's forceful reprimand. Excuse me? Kamal looked down at him disrespectfully and muttered, Can I go? Mr. Njama stood, allowing his face to show outrage. He bent close to Kamal so that his lips rubbed against Kamal's nose when he spoke. Son, I have given you a good life these past 13 years. And if you are upset, if you think that you've been dealt a bad hand, if you think life can't get any worse, then you need to be more creative. Because I can certainly make years 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 more miserable than you can apparently imagine. Are we clear? 
Tamal's eyes were as big as saucers. His head and torso were arched back as he tried to get away from his father's yelling and spitting. He replied, yes, sir. Mr. Njama stood there, lips to nose, peering into Kamal's eyes. Kamal's brain, which must have been stunned by Mr. Njama's hot, garlicky breath, finally came alive. Then Kamal asked with a great deal more respectfulness than before, sir, may I be excused? Hearing these words, Mr. Njama straightened up, stepped back, and replied in a most pleasant tone and with a hint of a smile. Of course. If you'd like, we can talk about the Akit later this evening. When Kamal left, Jabari joined Ayana in the kitchen and helped her to clean the dishes. She looked at him inquisitively. Did you know about these prepubescent plans? I knew something, but I didn't know Kamal's plan. Well, Salters reached out to me last week. He didn't say anything about the camp, but I could tell that he was feeling me out. He was trying to get an idea of how much we would let JV basketball invade our home. After that conversation, I assumed he was interested in having come out on the team. I just heard from Gary this afternoon. He was trying to get an idea of how much we would let that petty minimum wage job invade our home. I made assumptions there, too. Both Coach Salters and Gary knew the Njamas. In fact, most everyone throughout the city knew the Njamas. Most everyone also knew that the Njamas were weird. Their eating, their dress, their socializing was always a bit outside of the norm, and everything they did seemed overladen with rules and restrictions. It made people uncomfortable. To Kamau, it made life unbearable. At any rate, the Njamas also had a reputation throughout the city. They were intelligent, accomplished, and honorable people, and they were not pushovers. They would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any politician, cor corporate leader, or any criminal for that matter, they would stand up against anyone who tried to take advantage of them or their friends, and they would win. If you wanted to get something done, Jabari and Ayana and Jama were powerful allies to have, so people respected them. This is why Coach Salters and Gary took the time to talk with Jabari and Jama before approaching Kamal. Ayana smiled and said playfully, Well, if you knew all this, why didn't you tell Kamal? You know he's almost 14. You can't keep making decisions about his life without conferring with him. He smiled at her flirtatiously. That's funny, because I seem to remember that we created his life, and we didn't seek his approval or consult with him in any way. Ayana smiled dreamily and purred. No, we did not. Jabari reflected out loud. Were we that dim as teenagers? I don't think I was, but I'm quite certain you were. There's something about testosterone. It just overrides the reasoning part of the brain. Jabari nodded his head in agreement. Yes. It can do that. He breathed a sigh of resignation. Well, what can you do? Iana huffed. Just keep loving them. She gathered herself. Sir, I believe you've been called into work. You have an airport to build. Yes, I do. I'll finish cleaning. Jafari patted her backside, kissed her proper cheek, and went upstairs to, Ra to see Rafia. When he peered up the stairs, Rafia was looking down at him, crying. Daddy, the mile was gone. Section 3. An Awkward Dinner. O'Leary. Amelia fidgeted with her silverware as her eyes darted about. Daphne smiled at her warmly. Amelia, I just love your earrings. They complement your dress perfectly. Amelia giggled slightly through her thin, pursed lips. Thank you. And she looked away nervously. Timothy smiled and thought, How does Dan live with that sourpuss? Daphne continued her gushing. You have a gift for accessorizing. You've got to show me how you do it. We should make a day of it. Daphne smiled flirtatiously at Timothy. How much of these guys' money can we spend in an afternoon? Amelia hummed through her closed mouth, and Daphne had no idea what that meant. Timothy jumped in. Well, Daph, don't do too much. You wouldn't want to deprive us the pleasure of spoiling you. Timothy and Daphne laughed affectionately and Timothy watched Amelia smile. Or did she have gas? It was hard to tell. Her lips stretched slightly, and they, but they never parted. There was no spark in her eyes. There was no joy. Yeah, it was probably just gas. Just then, Dan returned to the table. Seeing the awkwardness of his wife, he quickly took command. Thanks for your patience. Tim and Daphne, you are both good as gold. He smiled broadly and rubbed Amelia's back. Daniel Silverstein was senior vice president of the Biological Technology Division at, of Tech Energen. Within the company, it's simply known as Biotech. 
Given Dan's academic and professional background, this position was a tremendous accomplishment because he was not a high achiever. As a student, he was good, but not great. As an intern, he was good, but not great. As an entry-level researcher, he was good, but not great. In fact, at every point in his career trajectory, he was extremely mediocre. Where he excelled was in his ability to advance. And here he had two special gifts. His first special gift was that he was a social chameleon. He was able to blend seamlessly into any social situation. Once there, he knew how to make himself beloved. His second special gift was that he knew how to pick the right people. He knew who to befriend, who to mentor, who to be mentored by, even who to fight. His one failing seemed to be his wife. No one quite understood how or why he picked her. By contrast, his greatest pick was Timothy O'Leary. They had first met when Timothy was a college student. He was working at a, as a summer research intern with Dr. William Crosby, one of the research coordinators at Tech Energy. Daniel, who had been vying for a promotion to a position as research coordinator, spent a lot of time around Dr. Crosby's research team, especially the interns. He often took them to lunch and asked a lot of questions about the research. He especially gravitated to Timothy, who was very knowledgeable and very friendly. Daniel felt safe with Timothy. Near the end of that summer, and just a week before the internship would end, Timothy overheard Dr. Crosby having a heated exchange with the senior vice president for, for R&D. Dr. Crosby was accused of fabricating data for the project on which Timothy was working. This came as a shock to Timothy, as he was familiar with the research and could verify that there was no fabrication. But he was only a college student. No one would believe his word over that of a well-established senior scientist. Two months after his research internship ended, Timothy heard that Dr. Daniel Silverstein had replaced Dr. Crosby's research, excuse me, had replicated Dr. Crosby's research and replaced him as research coordinator. Upon hearing this, Timothy went to Dr. Crosby's office at Tech Energen with a package. He was told that Dr. Crosby no longer worked at the company and that his replacement, Daniel Silverstein, was unavailable. So Timothy left a package with Dan's secretary, Marlene. The package was addressed to Dr. Crosby and it contained copies of the original data from the summer research project. It also contained a note thanking Dr. Crosby for the research opportunity and indicating that Timothy was still in possession of his own copy of this data. Once he received the package, Dan reached out to Timothy and offered him a position as lead intern the following summer. This is a position that Dan created specifically for Timothy. Once he graduated from college, Dan offered Timothy a position with a starting salary that was 40% higher than any other offer he had received. From that point on, Dan and Timothy were inseparable. Whenever Dan advanced, he made certain to give Timothy the best position possible and always under his own supervision. In return, Timothy did excellent work. Timothy was a brilliant scientist, one of the best. He was a far better scientist than Dan, but this never interfered with their arrangement. Timothy was not self-seeking. He was not envious. He was content to toil away in obscurity. In fact, to many, he was too passive. He was sometimes criticized for not seeking advancement more aggressively, and he may have had good reason for this approach. Marlene once overheard him speaking in hushed tones to Daphne. This is a difficult business for African Americans. Dan is a good person. He's always taking care of me, and I trust him. Hearing this report from Marlene, Dan was secure in their arrangement. Speaking of gold, Dan smiled confidently across the table and looked squarely at Daphne. Daphne, you should know that I am on the verge of making you and your husband very wealthy. Timothy tried to mask his eagerness. Oh, really, Dan? Well, do tell. Maybe it was his, the nasal whininess of Timothy's voice, or perhaps it was Dan's repulsive self-importance. Whatever it was, Dan ignored Timothy the same way an adult ignores a nagging child. Daphne, Nick Anagen has never had an African-American hold the position of senior vice president. But if all goes well, he looked condescendingly at Timothy. And if you play your cards right, then back to Daphne. Your husband will be the first to hold that honor. Daphne smiled as though impressed and appreciative. Amelia's face contorted into that gassy smile as she cooed. Oh, Dan, that's so kind of you. Dan nodded in agreement. He seemed to approve of himself. Timothy whined again. Well, thank you, Dan. That is very generous. What's the project? Maybe I can help. 
Dan chuckled dismissively. No, Tim. This is a project that I'm better off handling alone. He could fall loudly. And besides, the promotion is not a gift if you have to work for it. Amelia grinned smugly as Dan scanned the faces of both Timothy and Daphne. Both of them sat there grinning at Dan. In fact, they were admiring him. Neither of them, it seemed, had a modicum of self-respect. Section 4. Kamal Plans His Escape After being dismissed from the table, Kamal sat in his room and fumed. His face contorted into a snarl, and wicked thoughts paraded through his mind. Who does he think he is? What 13-year-old needs to get permission to get up from a table? I'm almost 14. You can save that for Rafia, not for me. I'm not a child. Who does he think I am getting in my face to talk? Next time I ought to headbutt him. What kind of man would try to keep another man from making money? He must be insecure. I'll show him. I don't need this house. I can take care of myself. Kamal had worked himself into a frenzy. He was angrier now than he had been at the table. But now he had a plan. He made two phone calls. The first call was to his mother's mother, Grandma Charlene. Kamal didn't think Grandma Charlene liked his father very much. She was always questioning Jabari's heavy-handed ways. Anyway, Grandma Charlene seemed a bit confused at first, but Kamal helped her to understand the gravity of the situation. Grandma Charlene agreed that Kamal had an understandable reason for concern and offered to let Kamal stay with her and Grandpa as long as he needed. They also agreed that Grandma Charlene would pick up Kamal Sunday at 2 o'clock p.m. from the community center. This would give Kamal a day to say goodbye to most of his friends. The second call was to Imani. He would say goodbye to her now. After getting off the plane, off the phone, Imani, excuse me, after getting off the phone with Imani, he walked over to her house and they met in her backyard. Kamal told her what had happened with his father, how he had ignored Kamal's desire to play basketball, how he laughed at Kamal's prospect for a job, how he belittled Kamal in front of his mother and little sister, and how he threatened to beat Kamal. She commented, Kamal, I've never seen you this upset before. I just can't take it anymore. I can't take him anymore. That's why I'm leaving. Leaving, she shouted. She shouted this before she realized what she was doing. Then she moved closer to speak in softer tones. Kamal, where are you going to go? Is it that bad that you have to leave? Imani, you know better than anybody how bad it is. Everyone has a cell phone except me. Everyone goes to parties except me. Other kids go on dates. I can't go on a date unless he meets the girl, meets her parents, gets a completed application, a 500-word essay, and a background check. I can't watch TV. I can't listen to popular music. Now I can't even get a job. No, ma'am. I made up my mind. I'm leaving Sunday, and I wanted to tell you goodbye. Imani's voice trembled. Goodbye? Where are you going? You're leaving me. Imani was in disbelief. She had never imagined any phase of her life without Kamal. As she began to cry, she, jabbed, she dabbed tears from the corners of her eyes. Kamal stared off in the distance and said nothing. He was resolved. He refused to look at Imani because he knew he would get emotional, and he wanted her to see that. Imani gathered her composure, and they sat in each other's company for 15 minutes or so. They said nothing. They enjoyed the breeze and the city sounds that came in early summer. Imani broke the silence. Wait here, I have something for you. She ran into the house and returned, pinching a small piece of paper. As she got closer, Kamal could see that it was a two inch by three inch photograph. Keep this, she said. He nodded. I will. You know I don't plan to die. I just won't be able to see you as much because I won't be around the corner. I know. She hugged him tightly and long. You better get home before Bob and Jama sends out the troops. You don't want your plan to get discovered too soon. Kamal nodded again. Bye, sis. Mr. Njama ran to the top of the stairs, picked up Rafi and hugged her. It's okay, sweetheart. It's still early. Kamal may have gone, may have just gone out for a bit. Rafi rested her head on his shoulders and groaned softly. She wasn't convinced. As a matter of habit, the Njamas never went anywhere without letting each other know where they were going. If their three-block neighborhood was an oasis, the surrounding city was the desert. And it was a it was dangerous to stray too far. Rafia was too young to know about all the dangers that lurked outside, but it was strange for Kamal to go somewhere and not tell anyone. Hearing Rafia's cry, Ayana came to the bottom of the stairs and looked up. What's wrong? Kamal is gone. He set Rafia down and she grabbed his leg. I'll call Rafiki. He and I will canvas the neighborhood. 
A few moments later, Jabari returned to the kitchen with Rafia trailing behind. He's in Rafiki's backyard with Amani. Ayana looked at him, but said nothing. She didn't have to speak. Jabari knew what she was thinking. No, I'll give him a pass this evening. He still needs to get his head together. The three of them retired to the living room and read. Jabari read a magazine, Ayana read the newspaper, and Rafia read Daffy Dog Diva, which was one of her favorite books. After a time, Kamal stepped through the door to see Njama, to see Njama sitting peacefully. The peacefulness had him confused, and it was obvious. His eyes grew large and began darting around the room in search of an explanation, and he braced himself for a tongue lashing, but none came. No one said anything. Ms. Njama and Rafia didn't even look up at him. He stammered. Uh, hello? Mr. Njama, wearing a hint of a smile, looked at him, nodded, and replied, Hello. Then he returned to his reading. As Kamal headed to his room, he began to fume all over again. He thought, they don't care anything about me. I can't wait to leave this house. In his mind, he revisited his plan. There are just two more days. Tomorrow, I will let everything slide. I can't give them any warning. Kamal spent the rest of the evening in his room. He packed a duffel bag with two changes of clothes, a toothbrush, a small tube of toothpaste, and Imani's picture tucked inside a small envelope. He hid the duffel under his bed, laid down, and turned on the Friday night mix party. He kept the volume low so no one would hear it. The mix party, in fact, most contemporary hip-hop and R&B music, was frowned upon in the Ajama household. Within minutes, Kamal had fallen asleep. Section 5, Final Goodbyes. The next morning, Kamal woke, dressed, and went downstairs for breakfast. It was Saturday, and on Saturdays, Jabari cooked a big, juicy breakfast. Today's breakfast was spinach and green onion omelets, turkey sausage, waffles, strawberries, and orange juice. For the Ajamas, every meal was an ordeal. It took a lot of work than one might imagine. In this meal, for example, the eggs weren't actually store eggs. They were purchased from a family who lived just three houses down, where they kept a flock of backyard hens. Two families in the neighborhood had hens, and most people got their eggs from these families. The sausage was homemade. Once a year, Jabari and a few men from the neighborhood purchased 400 pounds of turkey meat from a farm on the outskirts of town. They spent the weekend making sausage. The waffles were made from scratch with whole wheat flour, and the Ajamas only ate the waffles with real maple syrup or with apple butter. They didn't eat maple flavored corn syrups. The strawberries were grown by another family in the, in the neighborhood that had a huge garden in their backyard, and the orange juice was fresh squeezed. As Kamal approached the breakfast table, he was conflicted. On one hand, the food was intoxicating. Like clockwork, the smell of the food wafted into his nose and hit some magical button in his brain that started his mouth watering. His stomach, rum his stomach rumbled with anticipation. Food in this house was unparalleled. It was unrivaled. It was hands down the best, the most addictive substance he had ever encountered. But on the other hand, it was so much work. It was too much work. Who in the world wanted to spend their entire weekend making sausage? Don't they have grocery stores for that? Don't you have better things to do with your life? What's worse? Much of this unnecessary drudgery fell on Kamal. He had to go around the neighborhood and trick or treat for groceries. Get the eggs from this house. Get the groceries, get the strawberries from another house. Get the meat from a farm. Who needs it? They should invent one house where you can get all your groceries, he thought wryly. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. We can call it the grocery store house. He smiled to himself, amused with his own wit. Mr. Njama interpreted this internal comedy, interrupted this inter internal comedy. Come out. If you plan to go out today, you will need to let your mother and me know where you're going. Come out, still feeling pleased with himself, replied, yes, sir. I apologize for leaving last night without permission. Today, I'm planning to see Andre after breakfast. I'll be back home for lunch. Then after lunch, I'll be going to the rec center to play basketball. His tone was, was respectful and showed none of the resentment he felt for having to give an account of his whereabouts. He was even more pleased with himself for having remained respectful. Do you want to speak with me today about the Aket? Mr. Njama asked. No, sir. The decision's been made. I'm fine with that. You can go to town with that cat, Kamal thought. Ty won't be there. Kamal spent the day with friends, just as he had described. 
He did not tell any of them that he would be leaving. That would be too risky. He didn't want word to get back to his father before he left. Instead, he focused on enjoying his day in the company of friends. He and Andre spent the morning talking about school and the girls at school, clothes and the kind of girls that clothes wear, cars and which cars get the most girls, sports and how many girls you can get when you play sports. And they also talked about girls. Later that day, he played pickup games for about three hours. He surprised himself. His game was really good. He thought, I might become one of the best point guards to ever play for Colt Salters. Kamal made sure to be home in time for dinner. He didn't want to cause any disturbance to the routine that might upset his plan. And dinner? It was a fabulous dinner. And halfway through, he realized it would be his last dinner in this house. After that realization, he went back for seconds. Then, throwing caution to the wind, and at the risk that he might be perceived as, gr as a greedy boy, he made sure to get thirds. It was a big, heaping plate of thirds. No one said a word. After dinner, he lumbered, pot-bellied up to his room, turned, on his, turned his radio on low, and spent the evening thumbing through magazines. He was content, for tomorrow he would be free. Section 6. Sunday Morning Visitors. The next morning, Kamal was awakened by his mother at 6.30 a.m. This was unusual. He was never up this early on a weekend, and his parents never woke him up. One of his many responsibilities was to wake himself up. And as far as he was concerned, waking up at 6.30 a.m. was very irresponsible. Someone owed his growing body two more hours of sleep. Mrs. Njama shook Kamal gently and explained, Kamal, we need you to get up early today. Two men will be coming to the house to do some work. Kamal turned away from the light and replied groggily, Okay, I'll be up at 8.30. I'll be out of the way, she persisted. Kamal, I don't need you out of the way. I need you to let them in the house. Trying desperately to hold on to sleep, Kamal negotiated away one hour. Okay, I'll get up at 7.30. Kamal felt the covers ripped from his body and a rush of cold air snatched the last vestiges of sleep from him just as abruptly. Kamal, wake up. The stern voice of his father boomed at him. As he turned towards his mother, sunlight seared his eyes to complete the awakening. Mr. Njama's booming voice continued. Kamal, your mother and I are taking Rafia to church this morning. Church? Kamal responded in shocked surprise. Among the blacks throughout the city, the Njamas were notorious for not attending church. It was another one of the many lifestyle practices that had them pegged as weird. Mr. Njama explained. Rafia was invited to church by one of her friends at school, and she agreed to go. Get cleaned up and come down for breakfast. Later this morning, two men will come to the house. You will let them in. You will see us late. You will see us later this morning. Kamal stretched himself and let out a strained, Yes, sir. As his parents walked away, Kamal climbed out of bed and thought, Why do they make me suffer like this? Breakfast was another culinary delight. Mr. Njama, Mrs. Njama, and Rafia were dressed to the nines. They looked like the first family of black Christendom. Kamal, not so much. In his frumpy jeans and faded t-shirt, he didn't quite fit this family portrait, but he didn't care. Today was his last day of abuse and bondage, and at 2 p.m., he would be free. With his parents and Rafia gone for the morning, Kamal spent his time watching TV. While the television wasn't banned in the Njama household, it was strongly discouraged. Mr. Njama also commented on how television, in fact, all media let him tell it, was responsible for the breakdown of society, especially black society. Broken homes, disrespectful children, immature and emotionally unstable adults, high anxiety, low self-esteem, obesity, hyper-consumerism, even hypersexuality. Really? All of this from just from the TV? It seemed a bit far-fetched to Kamal. He didn't need a TV to get excited at the sight of a hot chick. But what did he know? He barely watched it. This TV didn't get turned on more than once every two weeks. He flicked through the channels, cooking show, church service, soap opera, shopping show, church service. Who even wants to watch this thing, he thought. There's nothing on it. He finally let it settle on a Western, but he couldn't seem to get the volume right. It was either too soft for the speaking scenes or too loud for the action scenes. He decided to keep it low and miss some of the dialogue. He didn't want some nosy neighbor telling his folks his own business. 
At 8.30 a.m., a van pulled into the driveway. Kamal quickly turned off the TV and peered out the front window. What kind of company is this, he thought. There's no sign on the van. Maybe these are some of the community folks. Two men approached the house. They were dressed in black cargo pants, gray t-shirts, black boots, and black caps, like the ones they were in the military. One of the men was dark complected, lean, and held a clipboard. The second was taller, very muscular, and wore a stern look. It looked as though his arm would tear through his sleeve at any moment. The second man carried a small tool bag. What were they supposed to be fixing? He couldn't remember. Mao didn't trust the situation one bit. There was no signage on the van. There was no lettering on the uniforms. They didn't have name tags. And they wore all black. No one wears all black uniforms. No company sends workers out at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. These definitely weren't professional service workers. It all gave him a very bad feeling. Kamal's first thought was to refuse the men entrance and to call for help. Maybe they're friends of my father, he thought. I could probably call Baba Rafiki. He will be home. Then he imagined his father's anger and, and the chastisement he would receive for disobedience. Kamal cracked the door and left the chain on. Can I help you? The smaller man smiled. Yes, sir. We are here on a call for Mr. Njama. Is this the right home? Kamal was racking his brain, trying to get information to help him make a decision. If these men were here to do harm, he shouldn't let them, he shouldn't tell them what house this is. But if they were the workers his father told him about, then he should definitely let them in. He tried to buy time. What is the purpose of your call? The big man looked around furtively, and Kamal noticed. The smaller one gave an overly big smile and replied in an overly kind voice. We're friends of your father. He gave us a list of things to look at. We're going to take some measurements, leave him some estimates, and we'll be on our way. It all came clear to come out once. He realized that he didn't know these men. He knew, or at least recognized, everyone from the neighborhood. He had recognized most of the people that his parents interacted with, especially those that came to the house. And why were they dressed alike? If these aren't professional service workers, if they're just some guys helping on a job, they wouldn't come dressed alike. Kamal's heart throbbed in his chest. Now he was scared. He raised his voice almost to a yell and found bass he didn't know he had. Go away! Call on the police! Kamal began to close the door. Then hearing a response, he paused. No worries, young brother, the smaller man replied in his cheerful, friendly tone. We can come back when Mr. Njama is home. You are doing the right thing. You keep your house and yourself safe. With that, he turned to leave. Kamal watched as he turned towards his van and nodded to the larger man. His heart began to beat less vigorously, and he felt a wave of relief overtake him. He began to close the door. Close the door. Suddenly, he felt an explosion in his head, and he was thrown back into the living room. Okay. That is the end of chapter two. Because of the technical issue with, with the sound, uh, I reread a big part of chapter two, so there's not enough time to get into chapter three. We'll pick up with chapter three tomorrow. I do want to see if there are any questions. And I'll give it a little bit of wait time. Okay, so I'm going to assume there's no questions tonight. Um, one thing I'll I'll say, we'll get into Chapter 3 tomorrow, and tomorrow is Ujima, uh, Collective Work and Responsibility. Today was self-determination. And the story at this point didn't touch on self-determination too much, but there was a section where it does allude to this community. There's more information about the community that uh, the Njamas live in. And in this three-block oasis, this is one of the things that Kamau and his friends share with me. Um, the families do a lot of barter, a lot of shared pooling of resources, so that some families raise chickens, 
Uh, some families grow have gardens where they grow strawberries and collard greens and sweet potatoes. Uh, the men get together periodically, and uh, I think once a year, and they make sausage for the year from a farm that they have a, an arrangement with that's just on the outskirts of the city. And so this is a good example of of Kujitagalia self-determination. If we don't trust the food that, that's provided at our grocery stores, we can, in our communities, come together to provide healthful food for ourselves. But it's also an example of Ujima, uh, cooperative work and responsibility, so that we don't have to do this alone as, as individuals or individual families, but groups of families come together and, and share this responsibility. So that was one of the very interesting things about the community that uh, Tamao comes from. And of course, we'll we'll see a little bit more as, he, as the story goes on, but this is a recurring theme throughout his life as a, as a person. And the way he tells the story and what, what I picked up on was that much of this, he was not able to appreciate as, as the story begins, as a 13-year-old boy, uh, because he had not lived any other way. So for me, listening to him, I'm thinking, wow, that's a tremendous opportunity you have. But I realize that a kid, 13, who hasn't seen anything else, doesn't really fully appreciate what it takes to build that and what advantages it can accrue to you. Um, so I'm excited to move forward with the story and to to be able to see more of some of the um, principles of Kwanzaa, um, you know, manifest in in the way that the that the families live. And let me look at the Q and A. Okay, are there any characters based on people you know? Kamal. Kamal's mother seems like a lovely person and reminds me a little of your wife. <laughs> yes, you know, but and as as glowing as my description of Ayana and Jama is, I I wouldn't trade I wouldn't trade my wife for Ayana. I mean, she she's a wonderful woman, but my wife just she 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 up there. She better she she higher 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 status high higher quality. Um. So no, Ayana is not based on my wife, but for sure. I remember yesterday when I mentioned that we can tell a person's story from multiple perspectives. And so as she was described to me, I, th those positive traits jumped out at me. And all jokes aside, it probably did jump out at me to a large degree because that's what I admire in a woman. And that's what I see reflected in my own wife and, and in, our, in our home life. So for sure. And another thing... Um, this question makes me think of is it makes me think of a question that was asked yesterday about the impact this story could have on black children. Um, all of the books that I write, black kids read books, black kids read books. One of the goals is to present children with positive uplifting images of black children and families. And that may be another reason that I honed in on some of those uh, enduring and, and positive characteristics of Kamal's family and community so that our children could see what a, a whole intact marriage relationship with children can look like, that it doesn't have to be mired in argumentation and, and rancor and strife, that the kids can be well taken care of. They're still normal kids. They still have the same challenges and issues that kids have but they can be in supporting, nurturing, loving environments. And um, for sure, in, in Kamau's life, his mother is critical to, to ensuring that. Okay. All right, I wanna thank you all. Um, this is being recorded. I do intend to make the recordings available. Uh, I just need to, to make those um, also somewhere where we can all have access to them. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, 7 o'clock, Ujima. Bye-bye.